the epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic is New York. And at the epicenter of that epicenter is New York City. And at the central point of New York City was a hospital called Elmhurst, where we were hearing reports that very bad things were happening. Well, there is a nurse that, uh, a very talented nurse in Florida, that decided to go up and help up in New York and went up to New York and got placed inside of the Elmhurst Hospital. While she was there, what she saw was so disturbing that she took it upon herself to wear a hidden camera and bring in a recording device so that she could capture some of what she was seeing there. This is a brilliant uh, uh, production uh, that's been put together by Journeyman Productions, and I want to make sure that we give them a shout out. You're going to want to watch this entire uh, one hour expose, but here is just a taste of this incredible uh, brave nurse and her revelations as she risks everything to bring a camera and recording device into the epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic. Take a look at this. She began by telling us one of her most disturbing findings, that people who had repeatedly tested negative for COVID were being described as COVID confirmed. Okay, so if you look close, I'm in my patient's chart. I am pulling up like their laboratory results. So if you look here, you'll see COVID-19 bioreference lab. Here are the test results. As you can see, 5 1 2020 at uh, 1716, not detected. They test for a second time, 5 4 2020 um, at 1759, not detected. So both of those are negative. Scroll up to the top. This is my patient. They are on a vent and they are being called. COVID-19 confirmed. So not detected here, but so it's presumptive. Now, they're all... They are detective. They're saying it's positive. Not detective. But it's not what detective. Does say? What does that mean? So I you said that they were vented immediately upon being brought in, is that...? Yeah, so the thing is, is they're coming in with difficulty breathing. And a lot of these patients are really coming in with anxiety because everybody is, they're scared. They take them um, and they tell them pretty much that if they don't get on a vent, then they're probably not gonna survive. But the reality is if they get on that vent, the likelihood of them walking out the hospital is slim to none. You're saying they're putting non-COVID or COVID rule out with definite COVID patients. Yes. So I was only wondering, cause like I was looking at like all the patient rooms and like, this patient is in with like a non-COVID. I don't, I don't understand why they're doing that. I know, there's four patients in a row here yeah. that are non-COVID. And this is supposed to be the COVID place yeah. because seventh floor, they shut it down That's and they right. I'm, it. I'm confused. And then they're gonna have non-COVID there. Yeah. This is gonna be the only COVID, so they shouldn't put any non-COVIDs here. Well, that's what they've been doing. I have that right now happening. And like the guy oh, over I in, I had two yeah, that were two negatives, and they they end up positive. Like the guy over in twenty nine, I had him upstairs because I was on CCU before it. Yeah, and he came in with a, a with a stroke. I know that's what twenty six one was, a stroke, it's and no COVID, and no, he's got COVID, and he's on a vent. Well, because we gave it to him here incredible statements there revelations people not testing positive being told you know being listed as positive laying in rooms with people that are all positive only to be vented as though they're positive and perhaps catch the illness uh once again um you should really check out all the work being done by journeyman pictures go to their youtube channel journeyman pictures to see this expose and and many of the other great interviews uh that they've done uh around many topics of covid19 but uh, I want to say right now, it's absolutely an honor to bring on my next guest, Erin Olszewski, the uh, nurse at the center of this. Man, I got I to say, uh, that takes some real guts 
to go in to, you know, I've actually done it before. I've worn uh, cameras before. You, you can say that, but when you actually do it, it's very nerve-wracking, isn't it? You just, there's something about it, the idea you might be caught, you know, what am I doing here? Uh, but Aaron, why? What made you take that step? Um, I just felt that as a nurse, um, it's my duty to protect my patients. And I couldn't walk away from that being silent. Um, people have a right to know what's going on. And, you know, there were prior medical professionals speaking out about this um, and being blown off. Um, you know, and I felt that the only way to possibly be able to prove this is with proof, indisputable proof that they cannot take away. And, you know, yes, um, I risked a lot, but in my opinion, um, the risk is worth the reward because people around the United States, people around the world have been lied to. Wow. And, and just so that people understand your background, uh, you, were, you are an Iraqi war veteran. You fought for the United States of America in the Iraq war. Um, you know, so you've seen some really bad things out there, I would imagine. Uh, my understanding is you weren't a nurse when you were in Iraq, but you were actually a soldier. But did you feel, I mean, we've, they've described, especially Elmhurst Hospital, but many of these ERs and hospitals, they describe them as a war zone. Would you say that it fits that description also? Um, if... If I can honestly be totally transparent, Please. I feel like this is worse um, because it's it's fr it's almost like friendly fire. You know, people are walking into these hospitals assuming that they're going to be taken care of, and you are literally going to walk in there and you will never walk out. Um, it it's worse, and it is destroying obviously lives and it's destroying families it's destroying our economy everything about these numbers that you are hearing across the world um, globally it's it's a lie it is based on it's just based on lies it's based on bad care it's based on people being careless it's based on <sighs> bad Authority. Well, and, um, and, and, and just based on the video we watched in the beginning, it, they are manipulating the truth. I mean, tell me about the testing. So, a person comes in, they are having, you know, it sounded like some of them had been stroke patients. They give them a test. Uh, can you tell me about the testing? How long does it take to find out if your patient has tested positive or negative? Um, it would take anywhere from five to ten days. Yes. But I, I, I went and got a, I got tested with an antibody test that I'm pretty sure here in the middle of Austin, I did it for the show. I went and said, let's see how this goes. They gave me my results. I think it was 15 minutes at the most. Uh, do they not have that technology in, inside of Elmhurst Hospital? No. No, they don't. Um, the technology exists, like you said. Um, but they are not utilizing that, no. So if you come in and you're just, we don't even know, where are they putting you while we wait to find out? Um, on the floors, they're, they're putting you inside the hospital facility, um, and they are mixing the COVID and non-COVID, which is creating hospital-acquired infections, nosocomial um, infections. Um, so they are literally creating the pandemic that way. Unbelievable. I, just, just because this is something we've been reporting on, I remember there was another nurse uh, a few weeks back that spoke out um, about, I believe, the same hospital. Let's just take a look at what she had to say here. Literally, like, black lives don't matter here. And I mean, that's pretty sad that somebody who is white and lives hundreds of miles away from the city gives more of it about these people than the actual people in this city. These people aren't dying from COVID. 
Let me give you several examples here. <sighs> An anesthesiologist um, intubated the patients and for about five hours, like we were waiting on a chest X-ray to confirm that the placement was wrong. And in the meantime, while we're waiting for that, and we've told the anesthesiologist that it was placed wrong because like literally only one side of the chest is like inflating. Um, he dies. Okay. Um, a patient had a heart rate of 40. I was literally ran out of like the patient's room to get like the director of nursing who was standing out there. And I'm like, can you stop him? He's going to kill that patient. He's going to kill that patient if he defibrillates him with bradycardia and a heart rate of 40. And the director of nursing just shook his head and I turned around and he killed the dude. It's like going in the twilight zone. Like everyone here is okay with this. Look, the only way I can kind of put this into context for everybody is, and this is gonna be kind of an extreme example, this is like really the only thing I can come up with, is like if we were in Nazi Germany and they were like taking the Jews to go put them in a gas chamber, I'm the one like there saying, hey, this is not good, this is bad, this is wrong, we should not be doing this. And then everyone tells me, hang in there, you're doing a great job, you can't save everybody. They're murdering these people. That was Nurse Nicole Sirtek. Uh, I did make a mistake. I guess she wasn't at Elmhurst while she was um, recording that video. But obviously, you're not alone. Uh, inside of the hospital system where you work, uh, are you alone? Are you a minority? Are you a majority? What's happening with the nurses? And many of you are journeyman nurses, right? Many of you are traveling into New York to help out. What would you say, how many people are looking at this the same way that you and Nicole are? Um, that's a good, good thing to bring up because this is the problem I'm seeing with it. I actually spoke with Nicole on the phone last night and we were talking about this, is that the majority of the nurses there feel the same way I do. And we talked about it. I actually have it recorded you know I was there for a month and recording the entire time so what people have seen is just a sliver um, and every all these nurses feel the same exact way but everybody is afraid to speak out for the reason that they're threatened um, with obviously being sent home um, if you ask you know questions if you try to um, you know stick up for your patients and advocate for your patients like nurses are supposed to do you are reprimanded, um, and you know they they say over and over, you know, don't make any problems, keep it easy. We don't want to get kicked out, you know. And a lot of it is just based around either being scared of what's going to happen to you, or you know they don't want to lose that paycheck. Wow, and and it's a it's actually you were my understanding is you were in Florida, you were a nurse there, you were you were involved in treating uh, COVID nineteen patients there, correct? Correct. Yes. Now, um, did they? Was there a difference? That like we just we just heard a report about hydroxychloroquine. There's a huge Lancet papers just withdrawn uh, this study that said that hydroxychloroquine uh, was dangerous. Were they using hydroxychloroquine in Florida where you were? Absolutely. So we used the hydroxychloroquine and we used the zinc. Um, and when I arrived in New York, I found out very quickly that that was totally off limits. Um, and if you did or any provider did prescribe it, it would be grounds to be fired. Who's, who, where was that coming from? Where, how high up did that uh, go? So it was from Governor Cuomo, um, and that was as early as March, right around March. Um, and that's just how the, you know, it, that's how it went and you had to listen to it. And what I found is so ironic, you know, in that same, you know, those same orders, they granted all these medical professionals, they were all liability free if anything happened. So when you're inside these hospitals, already a very, you know, hospital that has very bad reviews, you can, it's public. Um, you know, you have liability-free medical professionals treating patients on ventilators with no family. So what do you think is going to happen? You know, that, then that leads me to, uh, in this incredible expose, 
what you described as maybe the worst day of your life. Remember, this is an Iraqi war vet who has seen a lot of bad days, I would guess. Take a look at what she describes as the worst day of her life. A 37-year-old, uh, which is my age, um, was not a DNR. He's a full code. His family in depth discussed with the doctors that they want us to do everything they can to save him. And he came in talking. He was very terrified. He was just like, you know, totally alert, knew what was going on, and they convinced him to be on a vet. Now he's dead. But the doctor said when I got into shift that um, if he codes, that we are not to resuscitate or try to save him. And we flipped. This is important. I just asked them if we can put a DNR order and they said no. That's up to the attending. Okay, so we're going to code him. That's what I said, and they said no, we're not. I said yes, we are. We're obligated to. So then I you got to say something though, like it's our license. Unfortunately, you guys got to put in an order. Or just something. That's what I said. Yeah. I said I'm obligated. Yeah. What did she so say? So then she's like, the higher up said. I said I don't care what they said. Yeah. What higher up? God? We don't have a God yeah. here making I said, decisions. I said I don't care what they said. So we're supposed to. He's not DNR, but we're treating it as DNR. Does his family know? His family knows the situation. They, I think they called them and they told them. Um, they were trying to do a school with him for uh, the okay. All day he spent like in the 80s saturating. <clears throat> it was the, the, this one on the forehead didn't work. It was this, this one worked. And yeah, it came yeah. back. And when I changed it, I was like, oh shoot, it's 90. Yeah. So they started playing around with the Oh shoot, it's 90. Because he's still on pressure. He changed right. the pulse ox you put him on AC from drop. his head to his finger, and well, he's yeah, like, no, oh, it's 90. Don't touch my he's fine. Well, Elmhurst does have a, a policy given, like a COVID policy given right. the scarcity of right. dialysis be, and blood. It can be a chem code, it can be whatever. That it's not, there's not a, it's a difference. Normally, the standard is whatever the family right. says, like we just do. So right. if they would say code them for a five years, like you just do that right. until they die. Um, it's a little bit different now because of the new policy in place with right. Dr in place which is that you don't need full family can like you can just tell someone that it's medically futile and that we're not right. willing to just pour blood and resources into something that is would be impossible to get back right but i look it's he's 37. all i can think about is that at least he knows that we were fighting for him when he died you know Aaron, um, we hear that the victims of COVID-19 tend to be over the age of 65 and suffering from other life-threatening illnesses. What you are describing and, and talking about, this is a 37-year-old man, correct? Yes. And as a nurse, it, it seemed, look, I understand there are scenarios where, you know, you can't resuscitate or it really wouldn't make sense. Someone is so far gone. But can you tell me what it was like to be hearing that and going through this over a young man with his whole life ahead of him, a family that is unable to visit and see how he's doing? You're the only person representing that family in that moment, are you not? I mean, he's all that we had, you know. Um, he doesn't have a voice otherwise, you know. And, like, these families are trusting in us to be taking care of them and, and trust us to do our jobs right. And if they don't have a good nurse, they really don't have a chance at all. And even if they have a good nurse, who's to say the next nurse on the shift or the next doctor on the shift is going to be good too and it just goes against every single thing that we've ever learned and that we're taught to do as nurses you know just to um be ethical and when something's wrong we have to we have to you know speak out about this because if we don't do it then who's going to and whatever it takes and whatever I have to risk, at least like I know that I'm giving these patients and their families the justice that they deserve. And so be it.
Can I, I ask know. you? Can I ask you? Was this gentleman uh, confirmed to be COVID nineteen positive? Um, at the end of his life, yes. Hospital acquired. So he got it while he was in the hospital. Yes. If you could get a message to Donald Trump right now, who is having to make decisions, I think obviously, you know, he can speak to Tony Fauci, Debbie Burks, these people that are in, what, what do you need our leadership to know? What do you want the National Institute of Health to know? What do you want Andrew Cuomo to know? Um, I want them to know that what is happening and even still, um, it's still happening. I have friends that are still there. That we need a federal investigation immediately. We need to go there and we need to flip tables over. We need to go through every single chart. We need to contact every single family because a lot of bad stuff has happened. Um, there's, there has been no aut autopsies allowed. Um, and we just need to go to the absolutely highest power because I am just one person. But I know that there are a lot more people out there that have a lot more power than me. So I am willing to risk everything in order to bring justice, not only to like the patients, and not only to their families, but to the rest of the world. Because I know a lot of people have been going through horrible things. It has shut down the economy. It has taken out businesses. It has, you know, torn apart families. There has been a lot of suicide. I mean, there's so many things that this has affected and nobody will even look at this. And, you know, if they're going to do a federal investigation for the major league baseball steroids issue, then I don't see why they wouldn't do one here. Aaron, I know you're going to continue to be a voice now for the voiceless, and I want to thank you for your courage. Uh, you, I think, are representing your country in probably the most brave way you have so far in your life. So let me thank you for that from the high wire. Uh, continue to be brave. Let us know in any way that we can support you. Um, thank you so much for the truth. Thank you. Thank you, guys very much for allowing me to scream the truth. <laughs> if you like that clip, then be sure to check out our live broadcast of The High Wire every Thursday morning at 11 a.m. Pacific time. You can watch it on Facebook, YouTube, iTunes, and Twitter. We'll see you there.